picture there that I, it's kind of the, the less cheesy one that I could find. The other ones are a little bit, but that's it's just a great, great uh, visual on really holding on to those precious promises that are given as the person, the person said, to the few. <laughs> the few that really are seeking Him. The few that really have come to know Him. Um, and Second Peter, a lot, you know, there's not much to, to talk about the who, what, where, when, and why, and how. It's worth, um, it's worth mentioning again, though, that any time you start a book, whether it's uh, Peter, John, James, um, any of the, even the Old Testament books, ask yourself those questions. Who wrote this book? What is this book about? Why is it important? How does it divide up? A lot of them, some of them divide really neatly <laughs> into different sections. Um, uh, yeah, and so those, oh, and when is another one. When was this book written? Um, if you're into history, you really like that question. But uh, all those questions are important. Uh, but we know the author, and we've been looking at uh, First Peter. And now, as we ju jump into Second Peter, um, this chapter is a heavy chapter. And Dad kind of put the pressure on when he said next week we would be in chapter two. Um, that is not a certain thing, right? <laughs> Next week is not certain, is it? No. Tomorrow is not certain. Tonight is not certain. But um, just just uh, bear with me as we go through this. And uh, I love this first verse. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have, ob have obtained... Uh, like precious faith, that, that could be similar faith, similar precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these exceeding great and precious promises you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add. Add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity, or love. For if these things be in you, and abound, that they make you... Uh, that ye shall never be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, uh, brethren, uh, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, ye shall never fail, and never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be ne negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must, have, I must put off this tent, or my tabernacle, 
even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endure, uh, endeavor that ye may be able after my departure, my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses of His majesty. <laughs> For He received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard, and we were with Him in the holy mount. We also, we have also, today, in, in 2020, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well to take heed, as unto a light that shines in Sonoma County, a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Father, I lift up this time as we have opened up your word. I pray that we open our hearts that you give us ears to hear, help us to hear from you this morning as we are here, not only to worship you through psalms that we sing, but Lord, now through the study of your word, we desire to know you and to draw closer and to continue to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's a heavy chapter indeed, a heavy subject, precious promises. But the first uh, phrase there, name, really, there's two of them, Simon, Peter. And it should remind you and me, he did not use that name, by the way, in 1 Peter. It was just Peter. Here in 2 Peter, we, we see Simon, Peter. He has not forgotten where he came from. And it... it cuts me, maybe it does you too, how Simon, that, that name means what? Shifting sand. And Jesus took it further and said, son of Jonah. Not the, the most uh, reliable guy in the Old Testament. Read the story of Jonah. <laughs> son of Jonah. <laughs> that name does not carry with it much faithfulness or trustworthiness so Simon, but then Jesus, of course, changed his name to Pebble, Peter, Petros, Rock, something that's sure, a firm foundation. And so here we see the flesh, Simon, and the Spirit bound together just like you are, just like I am, just like we are. You know, for you, maybe you have a name that you were known by, a nickname by a group of friends in your before Christ days, right? So Simon Peter. But whether you were as bad as Paul was before he was saved, he was Saul. He could talk about a name change. Saul, Saul to Paul, Simon to Peter. Um, they are both, the next word in verse 1, a servant. It's actually better translated slave. A bond slave. Someone who chooses to be a slave. Peter identifies himself as a slave. And I don't want to step on any toes, but the term Pope is nowhere to be found. The job description of a Pope is nowhere in Scripture. You're not going to find the, the phrase or the term Pope anywhere in Scripture or the job description of the Pope. It appears nowhere in Scripture. The term has been given by, really, the, the Catholic Church 
And the word Catholic, if you didn't know this, just means universal. And it takes us back to a time when there weren't as many uh, sects of church where we have, you know, Methodist and Presbyterian and Baptist and, and you, you name it. We've, we've got it. <laughs> They're all out there, right? And so we have, a, in history, there was a time when it was just universal, and that's where the Catholic, uh, that word Catholic became such a broad phrase. But they had the history of the early church way off when they lifted and raised up not only Mary to the point of God, but Peter, um, they, they would say, and they still teach, that he was the first pope. There's nothing in the Bible that indicates that Peter was anyone lording it over anyone else. Anyone in any kind of position other than an apostle. Now the word apostle has become, in our day, something that people don't fully understand. An apostle just means someone who was sent. If you're sending someone, you are a servant or a slave of someone who's sending Doing the sending. So it's really, I am a servant, a servant of Jesus Christ. An apostle is like a servant. It's one who has been sent by his master. That's what Paul was. That's what Peter was. Don't let um, anyone with um, letters before their name, right? PhD, whatever. R-E-V, Reverend. <laughs> All the... the important titles that are out there, don't let them convince you otherwise. Um, this is very essential truth. And that Peter was a man, <coughs> fickle, not reliable. Um, Peter's denial is recorded in the Gospels for us. We get to know this big fisherman, Peter, and I'm encouraged, because I know who I am. I know who I was. Maybe you're encouraged too. We can be so <laughs> fickle. I don't know the better word for it. I'm all in Christ. They're, I know they'll all deny you, but not me. That was Peter. There's no way. <laughs> I'll never do it, you know. And yet he's the one warming himself by the fire in the presence of the enemies and trying to blend in as one of the enemy. And Simon Peter, that, that phrase, that name, should really cause you to perk up. It does for me. I love that Peter held on. Peter held on, though he f failed over and over and over again, Peter held on. Why? Verse 2. And, and don't miss the, uh, the righteousness of God comes by, um, how do we obtain it? It's that faith. Again, the rest of verse 1, easy to kind of skim over, but don't miss that. There is no righteousness, just as the last part of the uh, person to person, Romans 3, 10 through 12 uh, there's no, no righteousness in you. There's nothing in me that can obtain any of that. It's all, the end of verse 1, uh, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. The Siamese twins are often referred to in the New Testament. These two show up, and grace is that uh, Greek word, Greek greeting, um, that charis, and it means gift. Um, but the idea that the Greeks usually meant it by was uh, the favor of the gods. You know, these, they had all these different gods. <laughs> and demigods and, and bigger gods and gods in this area. May the gods have favor on you. That's the idea of charis, the greeting. That word carried that with the Greek, the, uh, the Greek culture. And then they, just like Paul would do over and over again, it's intertwined with shalom, which is what? The Jewish greeting. Shalom, peace. 
It's, it's the, the, the way that the Jews would greet one another. So you have the Greeks and the Jews right here in the beginning. Um, and it's, it's, it's really just, that's the fact that those can be multiplied, verse 2 goes on, unto us through the knowledge of God. Now, that little phrase you might want to take note of, underline, because if Second Peter has a theme, and, and I like to give books themes, um, all that means is we come across these words and these phrases. The theme of Second Peter you're going to see is the knowledge of God. It is throughout the book in each chapter, in all three chapters, right? It's, it's throughout the book, um, the knowledge of God, the knowledge of God. That's what it's all about. And that's how grace and peace will be multiplied unto you. But it's all according, verse 3 goes on, it's all according as His divine power has given unto us. So it's His power again, it's His favor, it's His goodness, and it's been given unto us, and I circled the word all. All means all, and that's all that all ever means. <laughs> all means all, encompassing everything we need that pertains unto life and godliness through the knowledge, there it is again, the knowledge of God, Him that has called us to glory and virtue. And I got my title from verse 4, which follows, we've been given, uh, whereby are given unto us these exceeding great and precious promises. You go through the Bible, and I challenge you, some homework assignment, try and write down all of the promises of God. They are innumerable. I mean, I wrote a few of them down. <laughs> Deuteronomy 7.9. Deuteronomy 7, 13 through 14. And you will lose me, don't try to keep up. Numbers 23, 19. First Kings 8, 5 through 6. Proverbs 8, 17. Psalm 9, 9. Joshua 1, 9. Hosea 14, 4. Zephaniah 3, 17. Hebrews 10, 23. It goes on and on. And the one that we all know by heart, John 3, 16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And here's the promise, the precious promise, that whosoever believes on Him will not perish but have eternal life. Talk about a precious promise. Don't ever let that verse get old or get tarnished by the world. <laughs> it's a precious promise. And there's... I just threw a few of them out there for you. If you caught a few of them, look them up. They are precious promises. I think the one that stands out, and my son, I named him Joshua. Josh 1.9. Joshua 1.9. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. He will never leave you. He will not forsake you. Though we deserve it. We have turned, I have turned my back on Him over and over and over again, and yet, He's never failed me. I, w I was writing down my testimony, typing it out and thinking through my testimony, and when I was a little boy, I had watched some silly, I don't know where my parents were, <laughs> I was watching some uh, scary movie, though, and I was about six years old, five or six years old, and it was really my older brothers watching this, and they didn't realize how into it I was. I couldn't tell you the name of the movie, but in the scene, the, there's a child in bed that, when he goes to get out of bed, there's an arm that comes out under the, under the bed and grabs the child's ankle, and, and you can imagine what goes on from there. Um, and I could not sleep because of that movie. I could not sleep that night. My brothers were snoring away. And I'm and we all shared, you know, two my two older brothers, we all shared a room and I, I went out into the living room and my dad was there watching the news 
yelling at the screen, I'm sure. <laughs> and I, I said, Dad, I can't sleep. You know, I was just in my little boy voice. I, I'm too scared. And my dad did not look at me and say, monsters aren't real, go back to bed. My dad didn't, didn't uh, wait and just rock me back to sleep. He began to tell me about angels and about demons and about spiritual world, <laughs> spiritual warfare. The reality that there is a spiritual war, a spiritual world that we don't ever see, but it's constantly going on. It's constantly going on. And the blessing, the precious promise that I hold on to and still sticks with me is that when he got to the part that Jesus can keep you from fear. That has stuck with me forever. He has never left. He's been with me ever since. Jesus has, has taken that fear Perfect love casts out all fear, right? And He has been with me ever since. And I, there's nothing you can do to obtain it. But this, this incredible promise, there's a song, I used to listen to a lot of Christian punk music, and I know you guys hear that and kind of turn, you know, turns off in your head, okay, he's lost it, but... But there was this phrase that I'll never forget um, that, that is always with me. And it's from that story of my testimony, really. Um, and it, it, the, the lyrics go like this. I have a confidence when no one is around. Sweet Jesus, he stomps my fears into the ground. The shadow of death is lurking in my head. But there cannot be a shadow unless light is shed. And that, those lyrics have stuck with me. They've rang true. He, he is with you wherever you go. That all comes from Joshua 1 9. <laughs> that whole rabbit trail we just went off in. <clears throat> he will be with you wherever you go. Do not fear. Do not, do not uh, grow weary in well doing. But I had to write this down. Do I believe? Verse 3, that God, as His divine power hath given, has given to us, past tense, all things that pertain unto life. You could just stop there. Do I believe that He has given to us all things that pertain to life? Now you're not going to like this, some of you. But I have to step on some toes. Everything you need to live life is in knowing Him. There is a false science that has really become like a religious system in our day. And it tells our whole population, and so many of you even maybe here in this room, that you have a chemical or a clinical depression. And, doesn't stop there. See, some people are already leaving. <laughs> that you're, you have this chemical and clinical or clinical depression. And for that, the root of your depression is some kind of a chemical un imbalance in your, in your brain. Um, and they, they diagnose people with this chemical or clinical depression, and for which they do no testing whatsoever uh, with, with what kind of chemicals are in your body. They don't do any blood work to make this diagnosis. All it is, is they ask you subjective questions, and from your answers, they come to the conclusion that you need what they call antidepressants. Mm. There is over, I mean, the percentage would, I didn't write it down, but it would, it would blow you away, the amount of people that are living on antidepressants have been, have been diagnosed with this for which there is nothing 
It's a false science. If we... <laughs> If we really believed that all means all, then I don't need a pill. If we really believed this, this wouldn't, this this whole business um, wouldn't accept this false science. Um, it's what has driven this, and what makes it such a booming business is really the love of money. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And the love of money has driven the whole world to accept this false science. It's sales. It's, it's just amazing the amount of people that have thrown their lives away. If we knew how many people, uh, how many of our fellow Americans how many of our neighbors are under the influence or mildly drunk and high all of the time? It would, it would blow your mind. I didn't want to step on toes, but I am. <laughs> Psychology could better be called a collection of theories by godless men. Psychology. I know it, it, it's got... People hold it up in high regard. It's a, it's a college course in our day. But it could be better be called a collection of theories by godless men. Sigmund Freud being the leading one who has rejected Christ. He disagrees with the word of God. Sigmund Freud built an entire belief on the notion that human beings are basically good. And he, he has, has built an entire... I mean, it's all from him. The, the whole idea, the whole thing of psychology. What it is, is the study of man. The root cause of so much that's wrong with us mentally is really spiritually. The root cause that causes physical, mental illness is oftentimes, now not always, there are exceptions, but it's, it's so often spiritual. It's usually bitterness, the unwillingness to forgive, it's guilt, it's fear. So, again I ask you, when we read in verse 3, all things that pertain to unto life. Do you believe it? That God has given to you all things. You don't need a car. He has given you all things. You don't need a pill. He has given you all things. <laughs> Look through the Old Testament and you will find David, Jeremiah, Elijah, Moses were bipolar Men who were suicidal, who, who were very depressed, more depressed than most of us, and they got through <laughs> without a pill. Can you believe it? Can you imagine now, if they had been medicated, would we have the book of Jeremiah, or Lamentations, or the Psalms? If they had been medicated and quieted, Sorry, but I had to go there. I don't know why. <laughs> the Spirit, the Spirit knows. But all things means all things. And it's, it's really true. We get so caught up in these, in these things and, and we don't realize the hold, the hold that they're taking, the grasp that they're taking in your mind, in your heart, in your life. You could not live without these things, whatever it may be. And God has made these incredible, precious, what does he say? Exceeding, great, and pre verse 4, precious promises. And that's what's caused us to what? Escape, the end of verse 4, having escaped all of the lust 
the greed, the love of money. Those things that the world is in corruption because of these things. We have escaped out of those things, and it's through His divine nature. It's, it's being made partakers of His divine nature. Do you understand what that means? You are a, a partaker of the divine nature. That's easy to say, but it's so hard to wrap our mind around that. You are a co-heir of Christ. That's, it's, it's incredible. We'll never fully get it this side of heaven. You are being seated with Christ. <laughs> you are a co-heir in the redemption that He brings. Here's another fun one I had to write down. Uh, what is more important, the creation of the world or the redemption of mankind? Well, if you're going by what the Bible has more to say about, it's redemption. Creation has a little bit in the first part of Genesis, a little bit in Job, a little bit that's in Isaiah. Uh, creation, though it is an important doctrine, it's an important event, obviously, it's not as important in God's eyes. Redemption, on the other hand, is on every page in this book. It's on every page. You will find the story of redemption. How do I know that creation is more important to him than, or sorry, <laughs> redemption is more important to him than creation? One of the big reasons is because it costs him more. The redemption costs God a lot more than the creation of the world did. Ever could. It cost him more. And so, understanding that we are partakers of that divine nature of that, and being co-heirs with Him, that's huge. That is huge. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. That we could, that we could be brought in, and, and part of the humbling part of, of partaking of communion and coming to the table Part of that is understanding I am taking in Christ. Um, the way that Paul put it in Galatians 2.20, I think is the best. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer me living and breathing and acting. It's Him. <laughs> in the life I now live, I live in the flesh, but I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. <clears throat> Hallelujah. So we've escaped the corruption of the world. And verse 5, I think, I think this verse convicted me the most. And that is this little phrase in verse 5. And beside this, giving all diligence. There it is. Giving all diligence. Not enough people do this. Not enough people give all diligence and do, do good diligence. A lot of people dabble in church, in the Bible, in, in the Christianity. They, they, they will say to themselves, we found a great church, we'll go once a week. See how that works for you. That's dabbling. <laughs> that is dabbling in... And, and most of America does it. Everywhere. I will go once a week. But to do all diligence, to, to give, verse 5, all diligence, this is how, verse 5 goes on, you are going to add to your faith. Are you adding to your faith? Or are you just where you were when you were six years old? when you were 12 years old, when you were 39, for my dad. 34, sorry, 34, yeah. when he got saved. <laughs> really turned up his life around. Are you growing and adding? And do you give all diligence? And that's where the adding starts, and that's where that whole list of, you know, <laughs> add to your faith, 
Virtue to virtue, knowledge to knowledge, temperance. Temperance could be better translated self-control, patience, godliness. It's all leading up, though, at the end of verse 7 to what? Love, charity, and it's God's love. It's not Hollywood romance love that you so often see exalted in books and movies and Facebook, everyone, everywhere. Watch out, it's coming up soon. Friday, right? St. Valentine. Oh no, oh no. And all the singles said, oh no. <laughs> Here we go again, right? There is too many people that just sort of dabble in the Bible, um, in Christianity. Can I encourage you with Peter? Can I encourage you this morning? To give all diligence. Do you want to be great at something? How do you get good at playing baseball? You eat and you breathe and you sleep baseball. <laughs> and you will get maybe to the minors. You, you want to get good at something, you do it with diligence. Can I encourage you? to see you coming to Bible study, coming to fellowship, come to pray tonight at Bible study, coming to fellowship, coming to pray, Wednesday night, Thursday night, more than once a week. I'm challenging you that are you going to be all in or is it just kind of dabbling here and dabbling there. I didn't say who's not for me is against me. My master did. I didn't say he who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not cut out to follow me. Jesus said that. I didn't say unless someone hates their father, mother, brother, sister, wife, children, the idea is there. Unless you forsake them, you're not cut out. Jesus is the one who came up with this whole idea of being all in. Are you all in? Make up your mind before it's too late. Peter knew in this whole letter, this whole chap chapter, verse uh, chapter 1 in 2 Peter here, you get the sense, especially in verse 12 and 13, that, um, and verse 14, that Peter knew his time was coming to an end. He says, I'm putting off this tent. I'm about to be crucified. Now, Peter knew uh, his end, and he did not want to be crucified in the same way. So they crucified Peter upside down so that he would not... Uh, he knew that he was, he was nowhere near the type, the type of person that Jesus was. So he... But he knew that his end was coming. Do you? <laughs> Do you know that the, the time is, is not promised? That, as I said, tonight is not promised. I could step out into eternity as I cross the road. I could step out and you can step out into eternity at any given point. We don't know. We're not promised. James uh, put it best when he said our life is a uh, vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. We, we don't know. So what are you doing with the time allotted to you? Teach me, Lord. Moses said in the Psalms to number my days and not to be dabbling in this and dabbling in that and this can help me out. Were you... <laughs> I heard this one too. I almost just misquoted it. Was God created... For you, or were you created for God? Think about that one. You hear these things and they take you back. <laughs> At least they take me back. And that's brought up here too in chapter 2. Over and over, what, is, uh, what does Peter say? Um, I don't know, Mike, you're just rambling on. I forgot what Peter said. You can say that, it's okay. <laughs> Verse 12, 
I will not be ne negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them. You've been told over and over and over again these truths. The end of verse 13. I stir you up by putting you in what? Remembrance. The temptation as a pastor, as, as someone in 2020, is to find some new thing, some new program, some test that I can give out to the people and they'll fill out questionnaires and we'll, we'll really get them involved this way. To find some new thing. Hey, no, the best teachers I've ever learned from were repeating themselves over and over and over again. I hope, I hope to be one that you hear me say things over and over and over again. Why? Because that's how you learn. That's how you grow. As a father of almost going to be four kids, <laughs> as a father of three, what happens when you're training up your children? You say the same thing over and over and over again. And that's how they what? Learn. That's how they learn, but also that's how they grow. They have all they need. At birth, it's all the body parts are there. Everything's there. That's back to verse 4, or verse 3. You, he's given to us all things we need. Everything's there, all packaged up. But and, and all we have to do is grow. We don't have to search for a third eye. We don't have to look for a fourth arm. That wasn't a joke. It's really true. We don't need extra things. And uh, we have enough out there. We have a more sure word, verse 19. I know we're kind of all over the place in this chapter, but verse 19. We have a more sure word of prophecy. And this, this word will go on in, in part of... Finishing First Chronicles on Sunday nights really do come out. Uh, I, you will be encouraged. Part of it is looking at David coming to the end of his life and Solomon taking the throne, taking uh, Solomon being given the kingdom, really. Um, David and Peter and Paul, they understood that men die, but the Word goes on. Men, do you understand this? That you die. Men die. But the word goes on. Experiences fade away. But the word endures forever. How do I know that? In Matthew 17, uh, Jesus is, goes up on the mountain. He takes Peter, the writer of this, uh, second, second Peter here. Peter, James, and John all go up on the mount with him. And that's what's being referred to in verse 18 when he says, we heard this voice on that holy mount. Matthew 17, the story's there. They go up on the mount. Moses and Elijah show up. They're having a staff meeting. Moses, Elijah, and, um, <laughs> and, and Jesus. And they're speaking of his, his second coming, but they're speaking of his death. And uh, it's Peter that pipes up. Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make you a tabernacle, and Elijah a tabernacle, and Moses, and maybe in mid-sentence, God cut him off. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. In other words, shut up, Peter. My translation. Why? Because Jesus is my son. He's not Elijah. He's not Moses. He's not some prophet. That's what Peter's, by saying what he was implying, let's make him a booth, let's make him a booth. It's, it's putting Jesus on that same level as a prophet and as, a, as Moses, as the lawgiver. No. This is my son. I've got 
way bigger plans on a different mount, Mount Calvary. And so that's what Peter is, is uh, in mind. He saw that. He was there. And it, it, it says that Jesus is, had, a, had a glow. He had the Mo glow. Remember Moses was, was up on a mountain too and came down and his face was glowing. Well, Jesus, it was like his whole body was glowing. And they saw that. And you would think, that, that's got to be incredible. Can you imagine seeing Jesus, not only that, seeing him in person, seeing him shine in all his glory. And then on top of that, Moses and Elijah show up. And then if that's not enough, a voice from heaven says, that's, that's the most confirming thing there is, right? No. Verse 19. <laughs> we have also a more sure word of prophecy. If you were given, here's a fun little question. If I came to you and I said, I got a time machine, we can go back to that moment up on the mount. We could see Jesus transfigured and, and Moses and Elijah. Or, I'll give you this Old Testament. You can read that. You have the choice. You can come with me and see all that incredible stuff. Or you have the Old Testament prophecies and scriptures. Most of us, I think, would take the trip up on the mount. Yeah, see, she's not shy about that. 